Today, we're going to continue our discussion about the book of Amos. Last time we left off with a block of oracles about things that God had noticed that brought him great distress in some other nations surrounding Israel. In the text we're looking at today, God makes an eighth claim, right? There's seven of these indictments against other nations, including Israel's neighbor, Judah, the southern kingdom, which was in covenant relationship with God. And now God turns his attention through Amos to an eighth indictment, an indictment against northern kingdom Israel. Last time, in this block of seven oracles against other nations, some atrocities, right? Some war crimes. We're talking about uh, some terrible overreaches of violence, even exporting uh, and human trafficking a whole group of people. And among this list of terrible, terrible things, God places this accusation that Israel is oppressing the most vulnerable of their society, the poor. I'm in a bubble. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals, those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and a father go into the same girl, so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and who was as strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you forty years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up some of your sons for prophets and some of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. Behold, I will press you down in your place, as a cart full of sheaves presses down. Flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain his strength, nor shall the mighty save his life. He who handles the bow shall not stand, and he who is swift of foot shall not save himself, nor shall he who rides the horse save his life. And he who is stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, declares the Lord. Let me read from Douglas Stewart's assessment of this indictment. There's four main issues, so let's just ruminate on those for just a moment. So it's quite evocative imagery, right? Trampling on the poor. And what is this bit about selling people for sandals? Selling people for sandals like what in the ancient world property transactions often involved symbolic gestures of the sandal for a couple of examples take a look at these passages so is Amos here talking about just normal regular practices because as tough as it is to hear uh, slavery was actually something that didn't go away even with the Old Testament covenant. Slavery in ancient Israel is different than what we've heard of in American history. The trajectory of scripture is actually towards a liberation this was a method of dealing with debts. And as tough as it is to hear, uh, this was an option that people had. Now, there were some protections in place. We can look at those as well. But is this talking about the practice that was, was allowed in, in Old Testament Israel in, in the covenant? No, this is actually something worse. And I think what Amos is doing is he's acknowledging perhaps a ritual with a double meaning, right? That, that sandals were symbolic in this, but that people were so devalued that their lives were worth as much as a sandal. 
And what's this bit about the Nazarite drinking? Well, let's explore that. The Nazarites were a special kind of people described in Numbers chapter 6. It was a way to show devotion to the Lord by growing out your hair and not drinking any wine. Awesome. And guys, did you see the religious irony here in these texts? That they were doing uh, worship at the altar and they were, they were uh, but while they were there, they had uh, cloaks that they stole from people and they were drinking wine that they used as fines. You see, Jeroboam II's Israel views itself as orthodox, that, that it views its, its, its worship as robust, that it's living righteously and, and piously. They don't seem to realize that this oppression is out of sync with their religion and that the resistance against oppression is part of true religion. God would not indict Israel for something that was part of the covenant. This was indeed a breach of these covenant values. This was the devaluing of human life that is not at all a part of God's covenant way of living. How would you categorize these issues if we were to take this block of issues that God is seeing as covenant infractions on par with these international atrocities? How would we categorize these? These are crimes against the most vulnerable of society. You see, when God gave Israel their covenant at Sinai, He set up a culture and a society that would help and support those who were vulnerable and oppressed. Let me give you some examples of some laws that God included in His legal structure, in His societal map for Israel that protected the least of these. So God is disturbed by the injustice he sees in Israelite society. So I think it's a great moment to pause and to ask, do we see injustices in our own? So then God moves into this section talking about the Amorites and there's this like historical block where God is recasting and recalling the relationship that Israel has had with Yahweh, God of Israel. And this is an interesting device because it's calling upon the covenant relationship they had. So this relationship they, they had and what God talks about his relationship with the Amorites has its roots all the way back in Genesis. So let's take a look at what God said to Abraham. Who were the Amorites and what did they have to do with this? All right, so we're here in the Abrahamic land grant. This is God clarifying to Abraham the land that he promises to give to his ancestors. So he says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know that for, for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. This is, as we'll see, talking about the Egyptian slavery experience. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, Egypt, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So the land of the Amorites, this land as listed here in verses uh, 18 through 21 is Amorite is a general term for the people that occupied the land of Canaan. So God is removing these people when their iniquity is complete and replacing them with Israel who will represent God. An Amorite is a general term for someone in the land of Canaan. So as we can see, the Amorites were a people whose iniquity was not full yet, and God had this grace about them. But the time came when God, the landlord, would remove that group of people and place Israel in that land, because it's his land. This theme is at play here again. We see at the covenant renewal of Exodus chapter 34 that God is telling Moses and the generation that would wander around the desert that their descendants would inherit the land 
of the Amorites. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, general term for the Canaanites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their ashram, for you shall worship no other god for the Lord whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So God took this oppressed group of people from Egypt and he brought them out of their own slavery because this was a key part of their identity. Uh, some of the protections that were in Israelite society, God mentioned in the context of remembering that they too were slaves. So who is God? He is someone that, that rescues and liberates the oppressed. So if that's part of God's identity, it better be part of Israel's identity too. It's his covenant people. So they, they come out of Egypt rescued by God and are invited into a covenant treaty with Yahweh, God of Israel. And with that covenant treaty, they were to testify to the world what kind of God just saved them. So let's take a look at a few passages that talk about this. So as you can see, guys, they were supposed to represent God on the world stage, that what they would do in their society would represent this God who heard the cries of the oppressed and who redeemed them. And something to do with that would witness to the world that God has drawn near and is indeed available for relationship. Now Israel was given this special covenant that this, this way of life, this just society would show the world what it was like when God dwelt among them. And so this redeemed people were to live justly. And that is the very thing that they are neglecting. God removed the Amorites who dwelled in Canaan and placed there Israel, the covenant people, to represent him. And what God is saying is, I, I removed the Amorites, right? And, and our orchardist prophet, right? He, he's, he's talking about them being like a tree and, and God uh, taking the fruits and the roots, right? We've got this orchard mindset and he takes down the mighty tree of the Amorites. And what God is warning is that he can do the same to Israel. This actually sounds really familiar, doesn't it? For us who read the New Testament. So let's take a look at Jesus' parable of the tenants and how this can help shape our understanding of what's happening here in the book of Amos. We're in Matthew chapter 21. Here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. So did you catch all of that? Jesus here is talking about God's relationship as if he's a landlord, which God is doing here in Amos. And he's saying that uh, he sent people to care for, to represent the interests of this landlord. And those people didn't do it right. And eventually they're living in rebellion. Group after group is sent to remind the people that were taking care of the landlord's property that it's his interests they should represent. And they reject those people.
So this theme stretches across the Old and New Testaments. And what we see here is that Jesus, in this prophetic indictment of Israel in his own day, because even by then, even after uh, God's punitive measures of sending Israel into exile, even after the covenant renewal of the days of the rebuilding, Nehemiah, Ezra, even after this, during Jesus' day, we find that indeed Israel is still perpetuating systems of injustice. And so Jesus comes to call that out. And what is the accusation against Jesus after this parable? They identify Jesus as prophet. So guys, prophecy, this holding to account nations to the standards of the kingdom of God, this is prophetic ministry. This is ministry not only of Amos and the Old Testament prophets who spit bars and wrote poetry, but it's also a ministry of Jesus. Are we representing God and his interests in the places we are at? Are we perpetuating systems of injustice? It's a prophetic task. This is what prophets are for, to call to account the people of God and to point out the areas in which those, the people who are designed, who are invited to represent him, aren't doing so. So we can hear this prophetic indictment and we can chew on it and we can think about it and, and we can ask God, as, as the Israelites should after listening to Amos, how am I out of sync with God? How is my society out of sync with God? And what can I do about it? If the people that are invited to represent him aren't representing him, he can remove them and invite someone else to represent him. As we acquaint ourselves with how to chew on and to respond to the genre, the biblical genre of prophecy, are there some ways to help us understand this? Well, I want to read a section of a foreword in Walter Brueggemann's uh, incredibly influential book, The Prophetic Imagination. This foreword, I think, captures some of what's happening here. So let's read this. Prophetic imagination proceeds through these three basic steps. One, it refuses denial and penetrates despair with honest cries over pain and loss that result from social injustices. Two, it overcomes amnesia by drawing on ancient artistic traditions that energize the community to imagine and live into a more just order. And three, it ends in hope and gratitude for the surprising gift of an emancipated future. As, as David Hankins goes on to say, prophets are not pundits, but poets and preachers. So what Amos is doing here in this text is, as, as Hankins put it in this foreword, is he's energizing the community to envision a more just order. Can we listen to Amos and do the same? Can we hear this rebuke against the injustices of Amos's day? and how Israel was oppressing the poor and taking advantage of the vulnerable rather than helping them and supporting them. Can we hear that and engage this prophetic imagination to imagine a better world? In some way, we don't have to go too far to imagine it because we get a preview of that kind of world, of that kind of kingdom, in the person and character of Christ. So church, may it be true among us that the vulnerable, that the oppressed, that the weak, that those people have a place here, that we don't take advantage of them, that we don't overburden them, but in fact, as the law of old inspired Israel to attempt, even if they failed, and then what the way of Jesus, the church lifestyle should invite, could we, be a people where the oppressed and the weak are made strong. So could we, like Amos and like Jesus, live lives attentive to the vulnerable and embody that within our own lives and with our structures that we are part of? Or will we, like Jeroboam II's Israel, become the oppressor in the tradition of the Amorites, of the Egyptians, and even in the tradition of Israel, Northern Kingdom Israel, will we be blind to the oppression? 
Will we be deaf to the vulnerable? I think there are two ways to respond to biblical prophecy. One is the way of Amos on the way of Jesus, to embrace the corrective word and to let it be a part of our own ministry. That as poets and preachers, we would call to account the injustice we see in the world. Or in the tradition of the Amorite and the Egyptian and Jeroboam II's Israel, we can become blind and hard-hearted to our oppressions. And I think in the long run, doing that will experience the same kind of crushing defeat that Israel is mentioned at the end of this passage. Restoration or defeat? Renewal or hard-heartedness? This is the continual question mark about encountering prophetic ministry. And in Christ, may we experience the renewal and the refreshment of being in the character of God that can make the kind of society that the prophetic imagination is looking for, looking for the kingdom coming down. Mm-hmm.